At the end of her life, I went to spend a lot of time with my mum and we talked a lot about life and what the most important lesson in life was. And the thing we agreed on is always take the interesting option. It may not make you rich. You know, I could have done other things and been much richer than I am. So my name is Richard Belfield. I'm a television producer, director. Um, I've also worked as a journalist. Uh, I've written books. I co-own two cafes and an ice cream business. And more recently, I've become a rather enthusiastic, but not very good potter. Uh, I started life, I was brought up in Africa. I went to a, a very, very good school in Ghana. The school was set up in the 1920s and the purpose of this school was for black and white children to be educated together. And it was one of the best things that ever happened to me because it just means I am, I just don't understand racism. I just, it's much easier to actually celebrate the best in everybody, which is what we were brought up to do. I went to university initially, I went to Oxford, left after a year, went to Manchester, um, edited the student newspaper, which was good fun. Left to university, went to the teacher training college, got to the front door and thought, this isn't me. And I can actually remember going to the door, putting my hand on the door and thinking, you will regret this. And it's one of those key moments in life when you just think, I'm going to take a different path. I don't know why I did it, but I walked away, um, went on the, on the dole, worked in cafes, washing up in cafes, started working for a local newspaper, which a group of friends and, and I set up. And it's quite an interesting newspaper. We got lots of good stories. We had quite a lot of impact on the local community. Um, it was a print newspaper. If we were to do it now, we would do it online. I started selling job stories to Granada, to the local news, got a job on Granada, local, Granada Reports, which was uh, an extraordinary education because every day we had to make half an hour of television from start from scratch, going at nine o'clock and you've got 30 minutes of television to film. That was really, it was a fantastic education because it was very pressurised. You had to think on your feet. I had a brilliant producer and you just couldn't, he just wouldn't accept the word no. So it was always about thinking on your feet, being creative, never accepting that something couldn't be done. And that was a really good, a good life lesson actually. Always accepting, never accepting defeat. It's a great you know, motto for life. I've been doing quite a lot of work with the students, both at the college and at the university in the media studies. And you can see who's going to make it. You know, those students who have that attitude of they're not going to give up, they're going to make it happen. So from local programmes, I went to work for World in Action, which was Granada's big investigative flagship. Did five years on that uh, and then left, um, became a producer director, worked for the BBC. Uh, then I um, freelanced for lots of people, had a production company um, and I've never really had a plan. So I've made documentaries or programmes for all the, all the British channels, uh, BBC ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5, Sky, and then in the States I've worked for Discovery, National Geographic, PBS, um, and then more recently Al Jazeera, which I really liked actually. I thought they were, they were very old-fashioned broadcasters who believed in telling the best story in the best way you could and actually they had a very good independent attitude which I really liked. They weren't they weren't going to be to be they weren't going to succumb to outside pressure. Um, I've done five books, been the lead writer on five books or sole writer. My last book was about um, a battle in 1972, the SAS, nine SAS, some some small boys and some pensioners against an invade, um, an insurgent army of 400. The battle takes about five hours and they prevailed. What was interesting about this war in Oman was that lots of military histories just tell it's all about guns and bullets and the technicalities of what weapons they've got. In this instance, the SAS, SAS guys had very little in the way of weapons, but what actually won the war was, was the fact, was genuine hearts and minds. And the key thing they did was they delivered babies, which meant that 
far fewer women died in childbirth, far more babies survived childbirth, and the mothers were just going, I think we should swap sides. We're saying to their, the men in their lives, I think we should swap sides because these guys are really helping us, you know, and they, and they would, they would do basic medicine and they would, they worked very closely with the community on a sort of low level. I've never had a plan, but I've always been sort of done investigative stuff and told stories and the rules of storytelling have not changed in thousands of years, whether it's a few old guys sitting around a fire in Greece in 2000 BC or it's now and it's Hollywood, the basic rules of storytelling do not change. And it doesn't matter what medium you work in. So I've worked in books, I've, I've written drama, I've written a libretto for an opera which was performed, I've done a pantomime um, and I've made films and pop videos and and at the moment I'm writing, gone, gone back to writing drama. And what's really interesting is the basic rules of storytelling do not change. I mean, if Dickens was alive today, he would be writing EastEnders. If you look at how Dickens structures things, you know, his books were being sold as were being, being bought through a magazine every fortnight. So every episode ends with a big hook. And if you look at any, any good storytelling, I tell you the first bit and then I plan to hook in your in your head so you need to keep watching and so in, in storytelling it doesn't matter if you're Virgil, you know, it's Aeneid, it's Shakespeare, it's now, it's the basic rules of storytelling are the same. You've basically got to hook your viewer or your reader whatever, you've got to maintain their interest, you've got to constantly intrigue them, you've got to almost seduce them to come in to be sharing your world. If it's, a, if it's a new world that they don't know anything about, you've got to, you've got to make that world exciting and not boring. Um, so one of the things I'm doing at the moment is to take the, a documentary I made and I'm working with some ex-students and we're turning it into a graphic book. And that's been really interesting because it's, sta it's storytelling, but I've never done a graphic book before. And what's fantastic about graphic books is you can do things in a different way. You can, I mean, when, when I watch a lot of documentaries, they start in second gear and they never change gear. You've got to change up and down. You've got to constantly change things. And the fantastic thing about working in graphic, in, that, in the graphic format, is you can constantly change the pace. You know, you can have a lot of action and then you can have a blank page and at the bottom it just has the word but or next. Oh, right, okay. So that's really exciting because it's the same rules of storytelling, but a completely new format. And having to learn a new format is really is 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 great, but it's it's still the basic rules. You you know, you've got to have good characters, you've got to have a good story. Always take the interesting option. And I think that's a really good lesson because it means that you have a much richer life. You may not make a lot of money, but that doesn't, ultimately that doesn't matter because actually, you know, there's a very nice Arab phrase, which is you measure your wealth by the people in your life. If you have a really good friends who are lifelong friends who stimulate you and who you, you stimulate them and you get on and that's, and that, and those people give you great quality of life then you are rich. I mean, I meet, occasionally meet people who are financially incredibly rich and they're really unhappy. You know, they have there's no substance to their life. They're skimming along the surface. When they get very, very rich, they don't trust anybody. They're terrified that somebody's gonna come along and take it all away from them. And so actually they're really miserable. And they go, well, how do you do all the, you know? And I just go, well, because if something else comes along that looks interesting, then I'll do it. I mean, I was talking to my son recently and he was saying, oh, you know, should I do this? Should I do that? Should I focus? And I went, no, no, just do everything. Just don't ever, you know, don't say no to different opportunities. It doesn't matter that you haven't done it before, but the basic rules apply. You know, you, you, you've got to stay calm. You've got to make clear decisions. And then also, I think the, the, the parallel thought to that is, only dead fish swim with the tide. I, re I remember reading that and thinking, that's really good because 
it's swimming against the tide. You know, lots of programs I've, I've done have really upset large numbers of people because you have large vested interests, often very large corporate interests who want to protect what they have. And you come along and go, oh, actually, that's wrong. And people get very upset. And it's really good because you realise that large organisations, doesn't matter whether they're large corporations or governments or intelligence organisations, are quite happy to lie. They have no compunction about lying to protect their interests. And often they're very good at it and they put huge pressure on broadcasters. Um, so now whenever I, I think I'm very, I find it quite difficult reading the news, particularly denials, because I just think, yeah, yeah, it's, you know. But then we now live, in, unfortunately, in an age of fake news. And that's, I think it's really hard now. Very, very much tougher because you have echo chambers. So you have two or three influencers will spin some complete nonsense. And then in no time at all, that echo chamber goes round their followers. But then it gets momentum. And I think that's the real problem with social media. Very, very difficult now to work out you know, what's true and what isn't. No, I think it's really frightening. I mean, I can clone you. Yeah. If I have enough of your voice, I can, I can produce, I can make a pretty good clone. And it's your voice. So there's, there's a downside, which is in the, so in up, the upside for drama and recreation is fantastic. The downside for documentary and truth is really hard because it's so easy now to fake worlds. So, you know, there's always a, there's a, <laughs> there's always a yin and yang and a, a good and a bad uh, to all of these things. You just have to take the best you can. So it must be nearly 10 years ago. Um, I worked, I set, helped set up um, two cafes and an ice cream business. People go, how do you do that? And they said, well, why not, you know? I mean, I was actually making a film about the assassination of Yasser Arafat at the time. And we raised a small amount of money, opened the cafe, and the women who work there are fantastic. I cannot admire them enough. They have completely transformed a community. There is now a community where there wasn't one before. You know, governments can talk about, oh, we're going to create, you know, local, the big society, but actually it's people who do it, and it's often on a local basis. I make films and I write, word, but it's all word-based, and I wanted to physically make something. So I just went to the college, uh, did, a, did two or three terms, and got hooked. So now I just make pottery. I go to a pottery drop-in every Monday, which is fantastic. There's a, there's a young man there. He's, he's really enthusiastic. And I just go, look, I want to do this. And it looks completely bonkers. And he goes, no, let's just do it. So uh, I've converted. I've got a shed here. Um, it was pretty derelict. My son and I put new walls on it, put a new roof on it. And then I've just fitted it out and not spent very much. I bought a wheel and a slab roller and started making pottery it's it's really nice because it's just different so I just do stuff which is very colorful and different I'm not very good I have to say technically I'm not very good but the reason for doing this is if I can basically spend half an hour every morning or an hour every day just making stuff I mean a lot of stuff will get thrown away and it'll be it'll be rubbish but I will actually improve my skill set to the point when I can start making stuff which is where I have the physical, where I have the technical skills to match what's in my head. Because at the moment I have my ambition <laughs> far outreaches my technical skills. So it's just that thing about not ever saying no. So years ago I went to, the, went to Luxor, to the Valleys of the Kings, the Queens and the Artisans. At the end of the day, I went to have a cup of tea with the man who lived in Howard Carter's house and he gave me this amazing book. And the great thing about the value of the artisans is that they're the people who actually made and decorated the tombs for the pharaohs. And there was this picture which I absolutely loved, which was the tomb of Mena. I thought what I'd really like to do is create Mena as a big vase. Um, it was a crazy thing to do but I just loved it because I just thought her face 
was so expressive. And whoever painted this, it could have been him painting his wife, but it's just a picture full of love. So I wanted to just make a piece of pottery which celebrated her. It's such a beautiful picture and now she's got a new lease of life. This is something I made very early on and it's just to remind myself of when I first started working in film. Anybody who's worked in a film edit will recognise this immediately. It's that moment when the celluloid takes on a life of its own and it just goes and then you've got to find all the bits and put them back together again. So what I've been trying to do is just do things that are different. So huge handles, you know, lots of nice bright colours, huge handle. I've, re I've really got into these big handles. I think they're just, they're kind of fun. And I always think, you know, what would Mary Quant do? And I think she'd do something like this, you know, big handle. And then I thought this would be quite fun. It would be to work with different colour palettes. So it's, it's a plate. But what's amazing about pottery is you do it and you put it in the kiln and then, then you've just got to keep your fingers crossed and hope it will come out. And when it does, it's just beautiful. Like, you know, this is the most exquisite. It's just a really beautiful blue glaze. It's just so lovely. I have no idea what I'm going to use that pot for, but it doesn't really matter. It's because it's about fun and then you've just got to trust to the, to the kiln gods and hope they, um, you know, they like what you do. So when I look at that, that makes me smile. And if I give it to someone and they look at it in the morning and it makes them smile, then it's not a piece of pottery, is it? It's something else. And that's really a nice thing to try and achieve. I'm just finishing an investigative documentary series as an InVision reporter, something I've never done before, and I'm hoping to start directing another six-part series in the very near future. I think the really important thing is don't ever let anybody tell you you can't do anything. Don't let anybody else define you. I mean, I know it sounds incredibly arrogant, but it doesn't matter that you fail. It's much better to try and fail. You know, I've failed at lots and lots of things. But I think the important thing is every time you fail, you get back up and you go back in and you keep going. It's very easy to sit on the sidelines and sneer and go, oh, well, that didn't work. Well, you didn't try it. So actually, if you didn't try it, I don't think you have the right to criticise. So my view is don't ever let anybody limit you. You know, just have a go. You know, it doesn't matter if you fail. It really doesn't matter if you fail because you learn more from your mistakes than you do from your successes. So just keep going, you know, and if something else comes along that looks really interesting, you've never done it before, just go for it.